Um, so I guess I'll get started with um, winter surveys and birding in Chihuahuan Desert, New Mexico. Uh, let me see if my slides here can advance. Give me one second. Oh, here it is. Okay. So I couldn't resist when I saw this. <laughs> when in New Mexico, you need to take a picture with an alien statue. Um, so I took this picture of myself on one of my days off when I went out to Hatch, New Mexico. Um, and there was just this chair there with my new coworker, <laughs> um, but I couldn't resist. Um, and here's a nice uh, Fano Peplo, one of the beautiful birds that um, I fell in love with out there. This was a lifer um, when I was out surveying birds out there. Um, I'm gonna start Ooh. talking a little bit about uh, my work while I was there. And then also it's gonna, I'm gonna also include um, just stories of me birding on my days off as well, um, because why not bird on your days off, even when you're not working? So, okay, so uh, last winter, I was working with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, um, serving grassland, wintering grassland birds in the Chihuahuan Desert. And so just to give you a little bit of a background of uh, why they have this very large project, this long-term monitoring project that's been happening since about 2007, is because many grassland birds, they breed in the Great Plains, they utilize the Chihuahuan Desert, as you can see this arrow pointing down, um, the Chihuahuan Desert region as their wintering grounds. Such birds, some birds such as chestnut collared longspur, thick-billed longspur, Sprague's pipit, but also the aplomado uh, falcon and uh, burring owls. And so starting off with the Vesper Sparrow, um, they started off monitoring Vesper Sparrows in 2007 um, as their first focal species. And with this monitoring project, the results focusing solely on Vesper Sparrow showed that the study suggested that grass height in these grasslands had a strong effect on survival during the winter. And the reason being is because uh, the grass height was about 30 centimeters, I believe. Um, it provides effective protection from predators. So they hide in these grasses. And it also provides effective protection from cold temperatures. And I think that's something that um, we don't think about. You think like, oh, we're in the desert, it's always hot. It's definitely not hot <laughs> in the desert during the winter. And so it's very windy, it's very dry, and it's pretty cold. And so a lot of these birds, their survival is impacted by these te these cold temperatures. And so from 2007 um, and moving forward to up to date, this study, this long-term monitoring project has produced uh, valuable information for about 30 grassland species. And included in those species is a Baird sparrow, which I was fortunate enough to see because um, don't know if many of you know how difficult it is to see and find a Baird sparrow. Um, they are really reliant on really nice grasslands. Um, <clears throat> and so this is not, unfortunately, this is not one of my uh, photos. When I did see it, I did see it clear like this, but I did not have my camera with me. Um, but also moving on to grasshopper sparrows as well, and so uh, what they're looking to do is implement habitat improvements and um, improve efforts for grassland birds. And they've created this network called the Sustainable Grass Grazing Network. And so what that is, is basically uh, looking at the habitat, looking at the vegetation and working with uh, landowners, and uh, most of them are ranchers, um, to develop um, this network and this grazing schedule where you can start to prevent uh, overgrazing during certain time periods of the year. And so their plan is to manage a mosaic of grassland conditions because not every single grassland bird needs the same condition. So they want to, it's the goal is to create this mosaic of grassland conditions to benefit multiple grassland species. And so this is what, this is one of my uh, winter mornings. Um, as you can see, let me get a pointer. Oh, that is not the pointer I want. Um, here it is. 
as you can see here, this is a lot of overgrazed pieces of grass. This is supposed to be grass here. And this is very well managed grassland. So if you're comparing Ooh. the two, it's a huge difference in what's happening. This is completely overgrazed, whereas this is well managed. And so while I was there, I had to learn the vegetation because I did vegetation surveys as well as the birds by sight and sounds during the first week of training, which was very intense. Um, I had to learn over 75 species of birds and over 25 species of plants. So like I said, very intense. <laughs> um, and so going back to this image, um, I like to use this image because it really shows how I don't know, to me, it shows that it's cold. It looks cold in this image. <laughs> um, so cold, dry, and sometimes very windy. Um, that also uh, influenced how we did our surveys. And when we did our surveys, uh, we weren't, um, we weren't, uh, we wouldn't do surveys if the wind was to a certain level, like if it was more than 10 to 15 miles per hour, uh, it's better not to do a survey then. Cause it's also hard to hear birds, it's winter time all they're doing is chipping. So <laughs> it's really hard to locate them to begin with because these grassland birds are very uh, secretive. Um, it was very remote. I was in locations where uh, no cell service. Um, I would use an inReach, which is a satellite emergency call um, kind of phone, um, only operating by satellite. And I would be out, um, out two to three nights um, when I did go out, um, and the lowest temperature that I camped in was 21 degrees. That was, uh, an interesting evening. <laughs> so, um, but I made it, I'm here, <laughs> but one of my favorite things that I really enjoyed, like once you get rid of the cold and the wind, and then, you know, kind of freaking out a little bit, cause you're in the middle of nowhere and you're by yourself with no cell service, the silence was beautiful. You know, it, I mean, there were so many times that I would be doing my surveys and it would just dawn on me like, wow, this is what the world is supposed to sound like without all the, the horns from cars and whatever. It was completely silent. So that was really beautiful. Here's another landscape image of what, um, you know, things look like out there in the Chihuahuan Desert. As you can see up here, it's snow. Um, I didn't have any surveys up here. Um, you know, I would drive in, there would be really rough, rough roads, some better than others. Um, and then I would walk in. So, you know, I'd end up somewhere in the middle here doing my survey and then, you know, walk back um, and drive out of there. Okay, so some of the fun things that I saw. One of the things unexpected is I never thought that I would see a sign that says warning eagles feeding on the road. So that was really cool. Um, Another thing was pronghorn. So uh, pronghorn were really, really, really cool to watch. And a lot of times when I would be out going to sites or, and so forth on these back roads, I don't know if they were doing this, but sometimes I felt like, are they racing me? <laughs> because it would be running on the side of the truck basically. And I could only go a certain speed limit, which was like, about 20 miles per hour, you know, or 15 miles per hour because the, words, the roads were so rough. So I was always very cautious of how I was driving um, and they would just fly right by me. So that was really cool. Um, also got to see Harris's antelope squirrel at one of my sites, which was a nice tree and a picari, um, which I learned is not a pig. Um, so that was fun, but that was on one of my days off. That wasn't during one of my surveys. And then Oryx at White Sands Missile Range. So um, a lot of my surveys were done on uh, Bureau of Land Management um, property, on ranches, um, as well as military bases. So at Fort Bliss, I um, had access to very far remote locations on Fort Bliss to do um, surveys there, as well as White Sands Missile Range. and. Oryx were really cool to see. Um, they are an invasive species. They were brought over for hunters. And now, unfortunately, they're kind of, uh, the population has gotten so large that they're causing problems for the grasslands in the Chihuahuan Desert. So that's a different bird chat or animal chat. <laughs> okay. And so 
once again, beautiful landscapes. Um, I really love the Chihuahuan Desert. I enjoyed working out there. Lots of things that want to poke you. So <laughs> um, being out in a field out there, a lot of things want to poke you. And I got poked a lot. Um, I spent a lot of time going, crawling under bobbed wire um, to get to my survey sites because, uh, because of ranchers um, managing their cattle. And my face looked like bef looked like that before I started a survey, but after crawling under a series of bobbed wire, it definitely didn't look like that. Um, just to give you an overview, that's my foot right here. Just to show you how uh, large some of these cacti spines can become. Um, I had encounters with bulls. Um, thankfully, a lot of the bulls that are out there, they were they usually are not as aggressive. Um, it was kind of explained to me that there's the breeding program kind of breeds a bit of aggression out of them, but you still had to be mindful of them. But I did run into them often enough. Um, once again, everything is trying to poke you. And then there's that. <laughs> so sometimes I'd have to be walking around a lot of that. And as you can see, it's very large. Um, okay, so we're gonna play a little quick game called Find That Bird. Um, so I'll give everyone about a minute to kind of look in this photo and see if you can find that bird. Um, this basically is what my view was when I would do my surveys. So this is kind of what it was like uh, trying to find these birds. I promise you there is a bird in that picture. <laughs> Okay, so we've got one horned lark, two horned lark, three. <laughs> um, so typically that's what work was like doing these surveys. Grassland birds, they are unbelievable at hiding and quite difficult to see sometimes, um, you know, between being camouflaged and just, you know, slipping through grasses, it was very difficult sometimes to, uh, to get them. Um, and moving on to sparrows. So sparrows, I, I enjoyed sparrows before, but I think now after doing this job, I really like sparrows. Um, they're annoyingly hard to find sometimes, but when they do, they're really cute. Um, so we have wonderful, um, oops, uh, sorry, wonderful sagebrush sparrow. What's going on here? Give me one second. Okay. And black throated sparrow. Black throated sparrow is one of my favorite sparrows. And so if you don't have your volume up, you should turn it up now because I do have uh, some audio that I recorded from black throated sparrow. So definitely one of my favorite little singers there. Um, we've got Lincoln Sparrow, uh, Brewer Sparrow, which were was they were lifers for me, really cool to see and um, tough to differentiate between clay colored sparrow, um, especially in a field. And like I mentioned before, you know you're always looking for birds there because they're hiding. So these guys were hiding like right under the shrubs, and they were difficult to get to. White Crown Sparrow. And a Rufus crown sparrow that I got on one of my days off, I was out hiking and um, I actually recorded this bird before I knew who was singing it. So here is the Rufus crown sparrow song. Another cute one. And then gray headed junco. So when I initially took this photo, I had um I had a uh, thought that it was a red backed junco, but then taking a closer look, I believe it's a gray headed junco. And so what was really cool out there is that norm I'm 
I'm uh, accustomed to seeing juncos when I'm in New York. They're, you know, nice winter birds. You always see the slate, um, slate colored junco. But what was really nice is being out there, I got to see the subspecies. And so that was cool between seeing this gray, gray headed junco and the pink sided junco. And then one of my favorites, again, green tailed towhee. And we have our classic chipping sparrow, lots of those out there. Uh, this fox sparrow, I also got, um, I've had fox sparrow before, but not the sooty. So this um, bird, I was out hiking and recording and um, it just popped up right in front of me. And I just got these really nice clear shots and it was just super showy and cooperative. And then a Vesper Sparrow. So I know I mentioned Vesper Sparrow before, but I wanted to mention it again because this photo, although it's a little bit dark and it's not directly in the light, I wanted to point out that this is one of the few times that I was able to see this character. So they have like this little chestnut patch that normally you don't see in the field. Um, but the way this bird was holding its wings and, you know, just kind of sitting there, um, I was lucky enough to get that, capture that character. <clears throat> So now on to Meadowlark. So I took this out of the Sibley Guide. Um, this was published in uh, August 15, 2022. And the reason why it was updated um, is because of the Chihuahua and Meadowlark. So starting off with, oops, starting off with Western Meadowlark, focusing more on the interior, on the interior here um, and comparing it to the Eastern Meadowlark, uh, we've got some more streaking that comes up on a breast versus here. And then, of course, the classic yellow creeping in on the western versus the clean malar stripe on the eastern. And so in a Chihuahuan desert, uh, my focus was western metalark. Um, had to keep my eye out for eastern metalark, but more so for the Chihuahuan metalark. And so <clears throat> Chihuahuan metalark is very pale the yellow does not creep into any of the black streaking and it has a really pale face. Um, and uh, the tail um, also has more white in the tail in flight. So I have some recordings of meadow larks here. So uh, where was I? Okay. Oh, sorry. So going back a little bit. So this Chihuahuan species now 100% as a species used to be the Lillian's subspecies of the Eastern Meadowlark, and it is no longer a subspecies. And the reason why is because their songs are very different. And so the best way to identify them was through their song. So I have an example here of Eastern Meadowlark song. So you can see the spectrogram shape if you just focus on the shape of this spectrogram for Eastern Meadowlark. This is the Chihuahuan Meadowlark, and the song is pretty different. And when you compare it to Western Meadowlark, it's very jumbled, it's kind of bubbly. And I have recordings of Chihuahuan Meadowlark and Western Meadowlark. And so I will play those two right now. Here is Chihuahuan. And then here is going to be, I will play next the Western metal arc. Oops. So the song between Chihuahuan Meadowlark and Western Meadowlark, the Western Meadowlark song is, is more bubbly, whereas the Chihuahuan Meadowlark song is more of a wispy kind of whistle. Um, so that was one thing that I had to really learn and be pretty confident on to make sure that um, I was focusing on the different calls, because in the distance, you know, trying to, to see if there's a little bit of yellow in the Mallar was, that was just ridiculous. It was too difficult to do that. So 
I relied uh, most of the time on the calls and the songs to differentiate between Chihuahuan and um, Chihuahuan and Western metal arc. So now moving on to chestnut colored long spur. I don't have an image of thick billed long spur, although I have seen them on my surveys. Chestnut collar long spur, there was one time that I was doing my transects and there were about 15 birds, about 10 feet in front of me. And I did not see them <laughs> until they spooked. They are notoriously difficult to see. And, but the nice thing is that they do hang out around the cattle ponds. And that's where I was able to get this image of them, but I barely got this image of them. And it's not that great of an image um, because it was pretty dark and they were moving quick. Um, on my off days, I did a lot of birding and Phanopepla became one of my favorites. Here's a female and here's a male, beautiful birds. I also learned that they do a lot of mimicry, which I was clueless to before. Um, I have recordings of two different calls these birds give off. Um, they're very delicate, so um, you have to listen a little carefully. They're not very loud. <clears throat> Sorry, I uh, did not mean to do that. Um, so that was the one call. And then the second one. So it's like this very cute little beep beep. Yeah, they're very sweet birds. Um, here we have the Veridin. Um, That was a fun one to try and uh get a photo of because they don't stay still um so that was pretty difficult um and juniper titmouse unfortunately i don't have a clear recording of them but juniper juniper titmouse uh was definitely a favorite because they're so cute and tiny um much smaller than uh tough the titmouse they're really plain and drab birds but they were super cute moving on to mountain bluebird so when i took this photo it was such an amazing um experience it was on one of my really, really remote surveys. And it was just so, it was just a beautiful moment in time because I had this flock of bluebirds that just came in on, onto like the area that I was surveying and they just behaved like I wasn't even there. And so they got really close to me and they were just foraging around on a creosote bush, you know, one to the other and just, just kind of like bopping around me. And it was just such a cool moment because they just got close and, you know, just kind of did not care at all that I was there. So that was really special. And then there's Spotted Toey. Um, I have a recording of this cute guy here. And the acorn woodpecker, that was um, really special. I actually didn't get this in New Mexico. Uh, there was one of the survey, one of my survey sites was very close to Portal, Arizona. So I kind of just drove over there and I ended up getting uh, this acorn woodpecker in Portal. Um, and the ladder back woodpecker, uh, I'll play that recording. It sounds very similar to, uh, kind of similar to uh, Downey and Harry. Um, let's see, I don't know why my mouse keeps disappearing. So I would see them often enough on my um, surveys. Um, if my surveys were by an, uh, a little uh, dry river and they had some tall um, trees there. Um, we have Woodhouse Scrub Jay. So um, sort of similar looking to a Florida Scrub Jay, but a uh, very cool bird, very noisy. And then 
um, we have this guy here that I also got in Portal. I did not get that in um, in the Chihuahuan Desert. I was in Portal when I um, was able to see this um, this J, this Mexican J. Um, hmm. Why am I not advancing here? Okay. And then what was really nice is seeing the different uh, plumages in the lesser goldfinch. So that was really nice to see um, all these different plumages in, um, happening in lesser goldfinch. Uh, says Phoebe, this was a really nice experience. Um, it This recording is different. It was not recorded from this bird that's in the image, but the story is basically, it was like around uh, March. And so uh birds were getting you know starting to sing now you know leaving the chips alone <laughs> and this bird started displaying in front of me and i'll play the recording and you can hear the progression of where the bird's call start it starts off kind of slow and then it just really starts to pick up and so when it picks up that's when the bird took flight and started doing these really cool circular flights and calling at the same time And then Black Phoebe, um, I that was a surprise for me. I wasn't expecting to get Black Phoebe, so that was pretty cool. Um, Townsend Solitaire, that was a fun sighting. And American Pippet, which was also really cool to see. Um, Buicks ran one of my favorite singers out there. And then rock wren on a rock. <laughs> I also had canyon wrens, but I didn't. I wasn't able to get an image of a canyon wren, unfortunately. Um, and then gambles quail; those were always cool to see. And what I found interesting is that whenever I saw a gambles quail, I also found the greater road runner. And so the story with the greater road runner, with this image, the two of them here, it was really cool. I was once again; it was one of my days off, and so I was watching this one bird kind of like to the left of me and I didn't know there was a second bird. And so I'm looking at 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 the roadrunner like what is it doing? So it was picking up sticks and kind of like doing stuff and I was like I don't know what's going on with this bird, but let me find out. So I just decided to like watch it and next thing you know it runs kind of the roadrunner ran <laughs> runs in front of me and kind of like makes a turn towards the cacti that you see in the in the photo and it just stood there it didn't do anything it just stood there with the stick in its in its bill and next thing you know the second roadrunner comes out and it, they start doing this really fun head bopping dance and tail wagging and so forth so I it was just a really sweet moment because it was so unexpected and I just didn't know what was this roadrunner doing and so that experience influenced um my illustration that I did for uh the Bird Conservancy Iraqis um so I did they asked me to do this illustration so they can include it into their thank you note for um all the landowners and ranchers that allow them to go on their lands to um conduct these surveys um so this illustration was inspired by that moment um and so we've got kestrels out there and really dark red tail hawks <laughs> um, and rarities. I had broadbill hummingbird out there and white winged scoter. Uh, I could not find the original of this photo um, because it got mixed up in a bunch of stuff. So this is the back of a camera photo, but I was so shocked um, to find a white winged scoter out there. That is the last thing I thought I would be seeing in New Mexico. Um, so yeah, and if you have any questions or comments. That was great. Thank you.
So your sites are in what part of New Mexico? The Chihuahuan Desert is in what part? It's the Chihuahuan Desert. It spans, uh, it also, it goes into Mexico, the Chihuahuan Desert. Like central and southern New Mexico? Yeah, southern. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, some of it goes into Texas and then in Mexico. So you're planning on going back next year, if you can? Oh, I will definitely want to go back <laughs> to the Chihuahuan Desert. I The first time I went out there was in 2017, but that was for a totally different reason. Um, and then ever since then, I just keep finding reasons to go back there. <laughs> so... Now, did you have any special shoes you like to wear when you went out? Well, definitely need to wear jeans or some kind of like cargo pants, because like I said, everything was out there poking me, like everything. There was not a day that didn't pass that I was not getting poked by something. So I had to make sure I had thicker pants that I wore, not necessarily for the cold, I mean, but more so because there's so many things sticking you. And then my shoes, I just had on my hiking, hiking boots. Um, yeah. So Brenda has a question. Did you spend a lot of time being still in order to observe or did the birds get used to your movement? So the method is basically it's, they were transect surveys. So basically you're walking slowly along, um, kind of a straight line, but not really a straight line, but you're walking along these um, these points to get to these points that have already been laid out in the study design. And so you, as you walk, you would flush birds and that's when you'll be able to see them. Um, because um, as I mentioned earlier, these grassland, most of these grassland species are very secretive and they won't move unless they're, it's the last minute and they're like, oh no, something's happening. And so that's why usually we would be walking the transects to spook them up a little bit. And so we could see them. Did you ever have to worry about like flash flooding out there? Um. Yeah, that was something, there was a time that uh, there were some storms coming in that um, I completed my survey, uh, but it was very close to, um, I had to kind of make that decision of, do I go on to the next one or not? Because um, I know flash floods do happen out there and um, the weather at the time was was fine, but I, at that moment it was like beginning springtime. So um, there were some storms rolling in occasionally. How long did it take you to do that picture of the road owner? That's beautiful. Oh, um, thanks. Uh, that, well, it usually takes me longer to decide what I'm going to do. But once I make the decision of how I want it to look, it goes pretty quick. So I don't know, I think maybe that took me actual drawing time maybe 15 hours or something like that, or 10 hours. It's beautiful. Thank you. And Anne wanted to know, how many days were you out there? Oh, I was, you mean the days that I was working out there? Yeah. Survey. Oh, uh, about three, three, uh, three months. Yeah, a solid three months. I just had to unmute myself and say, wow. I wasn't expecting you to be out there three months. Yeah, <laughs> three months. <laughs> all, all, all by yourself doing all those no, surveys? There, no, there was, a, well, I did the surveys by myself, but we had a team. So there was um, a central location where there was a team and everyone had like their different sites that they would go to. But I did do my surveys by myself. I see. Well, amazing. <laughs> I loved following along with you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and then Tammy wanted to know, well, I think you said you were by yourself, but how often did you run the transcripts? 
the transex transex i'm sorry trans girls. yeah that's okay <laughs> <laughs> um so basically it would be one a day um but the transcripts are large and on average they would take mm, it depends on it would depend on the amount of birds you see. You all, we also had to do vegetation. So it depend on like the type and the amount of vegetation was there. So the time was variable, but uh, it was one survey per day. Because oh, driving time also took time to get out to certain surveys because they were some of them were really far. Oh. Um, Tammy, uh, you did say vegetation, but she wanted to know, did you record things other than birds? So... And I think you mentioned vegetation. Were you recording that or? Yeah, yeah. We were um, surveying the types of vegetation that was in the habitat. Um, so they can have that data to have an idea of, um, so they'll be able to put it together as far as what birds are using, what type of ve vegetation in that area. Hmm. And Annie wanted to know, are there any snakes out there? Did you see any snakes? There are snakes out there and because it was winter, um, I wasn't too concerned about it. Um, they, uh, we did have, um, snake chaps to put on. Um, but I didn't use them because it was too cold for snakes. Um, I have been out in the Chihuahuan desert during summer and I have seen large rattlesnakes, um, out there, but I wasn't really concerned, um, during the winter. And then how many, Tammy wanted to know, how many survey plots did you cover? Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember my exact number, but it was a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I don't remember my exact number. I think after the end of this, at the end of the season, I was, I was, I was tired. <laughs> I was so tired. <laughs> now, did you repeat them? Some of the surveys, did you repeat the areas over those? No, mm -mm. no. I think that they, they are repeated um, in other seasons, but not like in the same season. Natasha, we just heard a talk on the Sky Islands of Arizona. And I guess that was just right over the border. So is the Chihuahuan Mountains part of that or different? Mm, that I'm not sure. I don't really know too much about Arizona. I've only been to Arizona once, which was when I prepped over to go to Portal really, Portal really quick. <laughs> and literally that was like a 30 minute drive from where I was. So um, that's as far as I've been in Arizona. Did you hear any reference to an island effect of endemics at the top of the mountains and stuff? Mm, I didn't hear anything about that, um, but it's possible. I didn't hear anything about it, though. You said there was snow at the top of the mountains. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had some snow on some of my surveys. Um, uh, yeah, I was I was also surprised, not not necessarily at the mountaintops, but in some of the areas where I did surveys, there was a little bit of snow here and there. Not like anything, you know, big. I mean, there was one day that I couldn't do a survey because it was snowing and it was snowing that much that it it was not acceptable to do a survey. If someone wanted to visit that area, what season would you recommend they go? Not winter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's kind of nice in a winter. I, I'm I'm biased. I like winter, so if not, I just <laughs> that's not. Um, I would say probably springtime. Like I've been there in the summer. And I've been in the winter and I haven't been in the spring. So that's something that's like, that's my next mission. I want to go in the spring. Um, but I would say like March, end of March or probably April is the better time because um, it's starting to warm up. Birds are starting to sing a bit. Um, yeah, I would say um, April, early May. I've been there in July and it's pretty hot. Um, but it was still really nice. What's the biggest city in that area? Like where do you? Oh, I was. From? Oh, uh, you fly into El Paso, um, and then, uh, gosh, I don't remember how long it is. Maybe about an hour or something like that. Drive to Las Cruces is where I was at. 
Nice. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Cool birds. Your, your shorebird experience and your wimbrels. You have such a well-rounded <laughs> experience. Yeah. <laughs> It was interesting to see that that chestnut patch on the Vesper Sparrow because yeah. we, we get a few of those here and I didn't know they had that. Yep. Very cool. So do you want to give them a little tidbit about like... Uh, <laughs> No, I'm not, no, <laughs> That's bit. no, about the, the ABA bird of the year, just kind of like a little bit about what you were selected to do and just a, just a little tidbit about that. Wow. What? I can't give you too much of a tidbit. You have to wait for the podcast to come out, okay. which will be next week. It'll be, there's next a full week. podcast coming out next week. So, so the ABA podcast. podcast, everyone should listen to that next week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. 